like to uh, begin this morning by inviting you to remember uh, where you started on your spiritual path, whether it was here at Mile High Church or somewhere else, and to ask you that, that general question, um, what would you tell yourself then? What would you want yourself to know then that you know now? Um, anybody? Maybe we have time to hear a couple short answers. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. I like There's that. No there is no separation. Beautiful. This is your true life. I love this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit in the audience and then have you all come up here. I am home at last. Home at last. I love it. So I have a, a long list of, of answers. I'm just going to share a, a few with you today. Um, the first would be not to get so caught up in the ideal that you lose touch with what's real. I think early on in this teaching, um, I got caught up in, in creating an ideal vision for myself, which is a wonderful thing to do, but sometimes I put this weight of wanting to become this perfect person. So that idealized vision of myself became so not who I was that it kept me from accepting who I am. And for me, if we're ever to have those moments where we experience divine perfection, they can only happen when we accept ourselves as we are. And it would also cause me at times to um, be more judgmental about situations and people expecting them to be more ideal or perfect than they really were. Uh, there's a Sufi story about uh, an older man and a younger man asks him, how come you never got married? And he shares, well, you know, in my early 20s, I set out to find the perfect wife. And I met one woman, and she was beautiful, and she was smart, but there was just way too much family drama. Just wasn't going to do it. Then I met uh, another woman, and she was beautiful and had a great family, uh, but I, I wanted someone that was more educated on, on philosophy and could have uh, more deep conversations. And then finally, I met the perfect woman. She was beautiful. She had a wonderful family. She was brilliant. And the younger man asked, well, what happened? And the man says, well, there was one problem. She was looking for the perfect husband. <laughs> and so, so often we can get lost in, in, in demanding a kind of perfection from our life instead of a, an authentic realness. Uh, the second thing for me is that this teaching isn't so much about manifesting stuff as it is enriching our consciousness. The great gift of this teaching is really in enriching our consciousness. Is it great to have wonderful demonstrations in our lives? Absolutely. Is it wonderful to know exactly what it is that you want and put it on your vision board? Absolutely. But I have ultimately found that the byproduct of a deepening consciousness is these incredible blessings that were directly in, in tune with my imagination or even better than I could have ever imagined. That consciousness that can appreciate the good of my life while it's taking place, being able to ground myself in the sense of a sacred, being able to live in a place of gratitude, being able to feel myself, that's what this teaching can give us. And everything else, all the manifestations, is just a byproduct. It's just the benefit. And lastly, in getting into the heart of the message today, get back. Something I wish I really knew then that I'm still learning now is it's not about how long you stay centered, it's about how quick you get back. It's not about how long you stay centered. It's about how quick you get back. You know, the purpose of this stuff is not to become perfect people. It's not to try and realize some sort of a enlightenment that no one has quite ever reached. It's to live in that grace of God and of love every day. I'd love to tell you that I'm a perfect father, but I'm not. I'd love to tell you I'm a perfect husband, but ask my wife. <laughs> I'm not. I'd love to tell you I'm a perfect minister, but I'm, but I'm not. But what I hope I'm getting better at is when I fall off center, when I make a mistake, I hope I'm becoming a better father by how quick I get back, a better husband by how quick I get back, a better minister by how quick I get back. It's not how long you stay centered, it's how quick you get back. Get back to love, get back to clarity, get back to life. 
And it's an amazing thing, I think, when you can look at your life, and I invite you to ask yourself this question, where I'm showing up not at my best, how can I make that a vehicle to become my best? How can that situation that isn't the best become a vehicle for the best to come forward? Because that's the miracle, the spiritual practice of coming back to center from anything that distracts or takes us away from it. So some steps to getting back today. Uh, The first is stop striving for perfection. (laughs) Not much of a bully. (laughs) Stop striving for perfection. Uh, An essential learning about spiritual leadership came for me when I I started uh, my first senior ministry at the uh, Seal Beach Church in Southern California. There's some friends here from Seal Beach today, Steve, uh, Lily, Amber is here, so it's really cool to have some guests. And uh, I inherited what I would call a motley crew of practitioners. <laughs> Very unique. There was an angel named Juanita. You guys know Juanita. Uh, and uh, there were these incredible people. I love them to death, so don't take this the wrong way. But they weren't my ideal of what practitioners should be. You know, some of them were kind of curmudgeon uh, A couple had been a part of uh, getting rid of a couple of the past ministers. One kind of bounced from church to church. And I, and I had to make this decision... Was it my work to try to build them up into the practitioners I think they should be? Or was it to accept them as they were so that they could be the best that they could be within our spiritual community? And that's what happened. And it was really, I think, the secret sauce to growing our community there because they were able to express themselves. Practitioners aren't holy people. They're flawed. They make mistakes. They struggle. But what makes them special is they stay committed spiritual practice. They stay committed to coming back to faith. And when the the congregation got to see that, they could see, oh my God, I'm a practitioner too. We're all practitioners. And that's what I love about the practitioners here in our spiritual community. They're not pretending to be holy people. They're examples of living full lives and all the struggles that take place in between, but knowing and keeping to that faith, that truth. There's a story I love about Abraham Lincoln it's in the middle of the Civil War, and he's finally winding down. I can't imagine how busy he was. So he's finally getting a rest, and there's a colonel that comes to the White House uh, to share that his, he had just learned that his wife had passed away, and he wanted a reprieve so he could go retrieve her body. And Lincoln, um, he was frustrated. Can I get no rest? Must I be bothered with all things at all time of the day? When will I get a break? I just can't do this right now. And the man had to go home. And you can guess Lincoln probably didn't get a very good rest. Uh, But I don't know about you, but I resonate with him a little bit. You know? Do do I have to get a text message when I'm eating my cereal? (sighs) Do I have a a sign around my neck that says open 24-7 for anything to talk about? You know, and, and it's good to have those boundaries, those self-care boundaries. So that, that's why that voice is okay when it comes up to listen to, am I taking care of myself? And yet, there are those situations of heart that call us um, to do God's work and not just our own work. And the beautiful part of the story for me is that the very next morning, Lincoln, hat in hand, is at the man's door. I was a brute last night. How can I help? It's not about how long you stay centered. It's how quick you get back, back to love, back to clarity, back to life. I love the famous quote from C.S. Lewis, we all want progress, but if you're on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. In that case, the one who turns back soonest is the most progressive. And that, for me, is the statement about Lincoln's leadership that's so powerful, is it didn't take a week, or he didn't try to make himself right. He admitted his mistake. And the, the question for us isn't, aren't, don't make mistakes, it's how quick can you come back to center when you do. And there's something powerful about that center. When we do leave it for a while, when we come back with greater clarity, it's enriched. It's deeper. It has something new and alive for us. The worst thing that we can do is to pretend to be centered when we're not. Anyone ever try that? 
You know, I just have to be honest with myself. Yes, I'm whole, perfect, and complete, but right now I'm a whole, perfect, and complete mess. I know I'm a licensed practitioner, but right now I feel like a licensed whack titioner. I'm centered, all right, in paranoia and fear. The only thing I'm clear about is how confused I am right now. There's something about that admission, see, that, that creates that, that doorway, that passageway to get back to center back to who we are, back to where we belong. Second tip, stay close to your source. Stay close to your source. I know I'm saying don't pretend to be centered when you're not, but know that that center is always there. You're not feeling your meditations too full of distractions? Meditate anyways. You're doing your prayers and you don't believe the words that are coming out of your mouth or in your mind? Say them anyways. Better than not praying at all. Those things that usually help you remember, those things on your altar or in a beautiful song that make you feel better, they're not making you feel good still. Surround yourself with them. I was walking our uh, beautiful labyrinth that we built in in May this week. How many of you have walked it? You got an opportunity right when you get outside the door, beautiful labyrinth there. And as I was walking it, I I was deeply reminded that life for me is not a a straight line. It's not linear in the sense of having a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's like a spiral. It's like a secular motion. It's like a labyrinth. And the power of the labyrinth for me is the the moment you walk into it, you're drawn in by that center. There's that center of who we are. And for me, that's life. I'm either walking closer to that center and remembering who I am, or I'm walking away from it and kind of forgetting who I am. But you know what? The center's always there. That's the beauty. The center is always there. So that when I walk into the center of the labyrinth, I'm remembering and having an experience of who I really am. And when I'm walking away from it again, I'm actually carrying that center with me. Stay close to your source. That's why we're um, trying out for the summer these spiritual practices here where we have the chapel open for meditation uh, through Thursday. And we have uh, yoga, which isn't super hard, you know, uh, pretzel uh, moving around yoga, but just, just movement and tai chi on Thursdays. It's to help us utilize this place like a spiritual gym so that we can stay close to our center. So whether you do your spiritual practice at home or in nature or here, stay close to your center because when you need it, it will reveal itself to you. Mother Teresa or Saint Teresa now as of 2016 uh, tells the story of being in Calcutta where she started a, an orphanage and she runs into a malnourished girl on the street and she brings her to the orphanage and they feed her, give her some toys, create a nice bed and she keeps leaving. They find her again, one of the sisters, they bring her back, she eats and then she's gone again and so finally Mother Teresa says, follow that girl, let's see where she's going. And they they find where she's going, and they get Mother Teresa, and she goes. And um, there's this little girl with this woman who's living between two trees in in a park, making really meager food on two stones. And Mother Teresa questions the girl, how is it that you would not stay with us? You had so many beautiful things in our home. The girl answered, I cannot live without my mother. She loves me. And Teresa realizes that this girl is experiencing an amount of love outside of the material good of her home uh, than she was in the home. And Teresa shares, while the child was with us, I could scarcely see a smile on her face. But when I found her there with her mother in the street, they were smiling. And and there's a, a message in there, I think, for all of us, that as much as you may be striving for material good, There's also that inner child within us that wants to be close and rooted in love, close to its source. As much as you may be out there climbing the ladder of success and good for you, recognize how important it is to keep your feet on the ground and stay rooted to that which reminds you of who you are, that makes you feel at at home. Because in those off moments, and they will happen, to know that that center is there nurturing us even when we don't know it, Uh, gives us the faith and the strength that we need to move forward in our lives in more powerful and constructive ways. The third tip for us today is let this error be a medium for a miracle. 
let this error be a medium for a miracle. There's no struggle in relationships in my life that has not been solved by getting back to love. There's no fear that hasn't been overcome but by getting back to faith. No distrust, doubt that hasn't been overcome by getting back to trust. And so when we're in those off-center places, remembering that which brings us to center, brings forth a new kind of miracle in our lives. Um, how many of you, show of hands, if you're willing to participate, uh, are in, a, in an active romantic partnership, married or with a partner? Okay. Uh, you keep raising your hands. How, how, how many of you have arguments? Okay. How many of you have a lot of arguments? How many of you were arguing this morning? Yeah, this is great. Just good. <laughs> Opening up. Yeah, my wife and I, we, we argue a lot. We've been together for uh, 10 years. We've been married for five years. And I don't know if you figured this out. Maybe it's just true for me. But you ever realize that, yes, the scenery and the characters and the situations change, but basically it's just the same argument over and over and over again? <laughs> It's always about one of us not feeling loved or supported or heard or understood. And usually the solution to the pragmatic problem is a pragmatic answer, but there's something deeper. And what I've been able to learn, and I think it's true in most of our partnerships, is it's a question of who's going to get back to love first? <laughs> Which one of us is going to get back to love first and invite the other back in? Because it's always the answer. It's always been that way in my relationship. When we get back to love, then there's that mutual appreciation that then gives us the common sense that we need to address whatever issue is happening. So I would invite you today to think about anywhere in your life where there may be a struggle, a challenge, and to ask yourself, what am I being called to get back to? And who knows Maybe this challenge is a vehicle for a miracle to take place. Maybe this mistake that I've made is an opportunity to become a better person. One more story for you today from uh, St. Francis of Assisi. I love St. Francis, great spiritual teacher. Doesn't always mix well with our, our teaching because he took a vow of, of poverty. He was an ascetic, you know, and we're an abundant people. <laughs> You know, prosperity, bring it on, more, more, more. And uh, St. Francis was like, no, don't want any possessions. He came from a lot of means. Um, don't want any, any clothes, just the ones on my back. Um, don't want to buy food, just want to ask for it. And so, you know, if we're talking to St. Francis, we're saying, well, don't you know you live in an abundant universe? And he would say, yes, but this is how I experience that abundant universe, by living in full faith and trust in God. And St. Francis is known as the um, uh, saint of, of animals, uh, not because he had a lot of pets, but because he was known to give sermons to the birds. He felt so spiritually connected that he would share that sense of presence um, wherever he was. And there was one evening where all the Franciscan monks, this early order of them, they were all sleeping in close quarters and they were fasting. Again, all these techniques, I can't recommend them, but I honor and respect them. And one of the monks is really hungry and he's so hungry that he begins to, he begins to weep. He begins to cry. He's so hungry. And I would just invite you to ask yourself as a spiritual leader, what would you do? You know, I'd make him a sandwich. <laughs> Here you go. You know, or may, maybe we'd let, you'd let him tough it out or say everything's going to be okay. Just stick with it and, and keep faith. Uh, I love what St. Francis did. He woke everyone up and they all ate together. Woke everyone up and they all ate together. No one dishonored. A negative situation turned into a moment of brotherhood and sisterhood of experiencing oneness and that higher power. I am guessing that there are several people here today or watching online who are feeling off-center. And I'm going to guess that the experience of being off-center is because of a judgment, because of an anger, because of a fear. And my message to you today is it's not worth it. It's not worth being right. It's not worth the judgment. It's not worth the fear. 
than staying in it. It's not worth the staying in doubt. There's a center always available to us, calling us thither from wherever we may have gotten ourselves stuck. And when we're willing to release it, we give that vehicle for a miracle the opportunity to take place. Mother Teresa said something uh, quite powerful and, and you know, just to state for her, God as a masculine presence. She says, we all long for heaven where God is, but we have it in our power to be in heaven with him right now, to be happy with him at this very moment. But being happy with him now means loving like he loves, helping like he helps, giving as he gives, serving as he serves, rescuing as he rescues, being with him 24 hours a day, touching him in his distressing disguise. Where in your life is that distressing disguise? And can you see it? You know, not sugarcoated, it's a struggle, but to see it as your opportunity to get back to center. Get back to center, get back to love, get back to clarity, get back to living your whole life again. And again, the center gets richer and richer. The byproduct of your enriched consciousness is greater healing, greater understanding, greater forgiveness. And there is that groundedness of knowing no matter how far we stray, that center is always there. Abraham Lincoln knew this. Mother Teresa knew this. St. Francis knew this. And you know this. That divine center that we can never escape from that's always calling us back to give us just that energy, just that sense of life, just that sense of renewal that we need to face the challenges of our day and to fully appreciate those sweet moments that remind us of that song of our soul, that song of our self, that all is well, that God is with us, and that there is a divine blessing here and now and continuing on its way.